start this party up again. Uh, the man we've been waiting for the whole time, we have the former CIA bomb tech and co-founder of Carver Methodology, over 40 years of government and commercial experience, veteran of the US Navy, Air National Guard, and CIA. His method was used to assess security at borders, high threat residences and facilities, and over 100 international airports. It uh, really doesn't need an introduction, but the godfather himself, Mr. Leo LeBay. Okay, guys, I, hopefully you can hear me all right. <clears throat> all right, basically what I'm going to uh, discuss is Carver and kind of how we got there uh, from beginning to end, because this started way, 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 way back. Uh, to give you an idea of what way back is and how we got there, I'm going to talk about the history of Carver, go into what a vulnerability assessment is. I want to go quickly through some of this stuff because some of it's already been covered uh, during the earlier part of the day. Design basis threats, you've heard that term. We'll talk about that a little bit. The Carver asset ranking and how that works uh, because it's very unique. And uh, Nick covered a little bit in uh, Solteria. I think that's how you pronounce it. But with that, uh, just a little background on myself, kind of three segments to my life. Uh, first segment was uh, military, uh, Navy, uh, almost eight years in the Navy, and then three years in the Air National Guard. That wasn't weekend, that was active duty full time as a bomb technician. Uh, the Air National Guard changed their uh, uh, requirements. They didn't need a bomb tech anymore. So the CIA was looking for bomb techs. Well, you know, after spending uh, eight years in the Navy, two tours of that in Vietnam, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. The CIA hired me, where'd they send me? Vietnam, so I spent another two tours in Vietnam. So 23 years in CIA, uh, those are kind of my uh, uh, long-term assignments. Uh, Middle East, uh, Central America, and uh, in Europe. And most of that was traveling throughout the regions while I was in those areas. After that, the private sector. And the private sector covered everything from Y-12 National Security uh, Facility, nuclear weapons, uh, down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And then other private sector uh, companies. I had one myself company called Telemus, then Raytheon, and then finally went to work for Luke in uh, 2011. And that was after Luke was working for me, so we kind of cha changed places. He became the boss, I and I... <laughs> <laughs> okay, history of Carver. Actually, Carver goes back a long ways, uh, actually to the mid-1970s, and I'll discuss that in a second. But really, Carver's used by the intelligence community, special operations, and the military quite extensively. And uh, in fact, DHS, who uses it, was using a, a system called ACAMS, Automatic, um, Automated uh, System or Critical Asset Management System. Uh, that was decommissioned in 2014, and they moved all the files to what they call the IP gateway. But what it was was DHS wanted to uh, assess every utility, every critical infrastructure in the U.S., and they used Carver to do that. And they're still doing it, doing it with Carver. Well, prior to Carver, there was a methodology called CARVE. It was mentioned earlier, C-A-R-V-E instead of C-A-R-V-E-R. -E and that was introduced in the mid-1970s because we had terrorism. Well, CARVE was an offensive methodology used to attack a target, where Carver was a defensive methodology used to defend a target. So we needed a change. So we found out Carver for terrorism, for doing defensive assessments, vulnerability assessments didn't work. So we ended up uh, taking Carver and changing it. Well, this is what Carver stood for. And that's very similar, almost the same, uh, method, uh, same criteria as Carver. We had criticality, single points of failure. Uh, we had accessibility, uh, ease of access, recuperability, a little different term there, time needed to restore operations, and then vulnerability based on operational capability, then a spy. I don't even know if a spy is a word, but it's the one we used in the old days, uh, the ability of a bad guy to recognize a target. Does he know it as a target? So a spy was used. Well, we had to make some changes, and the changes that we made 
was we needed a term or we needed a criteria for effect or consequence because a terrorist doesn't attack a target unless he's going to get something out of it. It's going to be some kind of effect. So we needed some kind of term that reflected the consequence of an attack, and that was effect. So now we've got criticality, same thing. Accessibility, same thing, ease of access. Recoverability instead of recuperability. Time and effort to recover a system. Uh, vulnerability, level of exposure to attack, usually based on the adversary's capability, but not always, 9-11. The bad guys didn't have capabilities to fly those big planes. What'd they do? They went to flight school. They learned how to uh, fly the plane. Didn't want to learn how to land it. Didn't want to learn how to take out. All they take off. All they wanted to do was aim it. And then effect, scope, and magnitude of adverse consequences that, uh, from malicious actions, but also the response to them. The fire department can come in and do more damage. No, no offense. No offense. <laughs> But sometimes the fire department or those uh, doing rescue or whatever can also damage the target uh, more so than the previous attack. Then recognizability, the ability to recognize a target as a target and recognize a target that would meet their goals. So we talk about target analysis and vulnerability assessment. Uh, and the one thing I want to uh, stress is you don't do either or. Both a target analysis and a vulnerability assessment are done in parallel. You kind of divide your head up in two. One side's doing a target analysis, that's how do I attack the target. The other side's doing a vulnerability assessment, how do I defend this target? If you can't come up with a methodology or a scenario to attack, there's no vulnerability, all right? So you gotta play the bad guy in addition to being the good guy. So target analysis, offensive methodology, Vulnerability assessment, that's a defensive methodology. So, vulnerability assessments, are they all created equal? No, all right? You've got a whole bunch of them out there. But there's two basic approaches. Qualitative, quantitative, asset-based, and scenario-based. Now, all vulnerability assessments today should be quantitative. In other words, there needs to be some results that quantify, your re that quantify the results so that you can rack and stack uh, your assets, rack and stack uh, uh, threats, all of those. Everything's got to be quantifiable. Uh, Asset-based or scenario-based, DHS uses asset-based vulnerability assessments. In other words, they can sit in their office on a computer and do a vulnerability assessment. Eh, not really, but they can do that, and they do do it. Uh, scenario-based means that you have to be able to come up with a methodology to attack that target before you can even possibly come up with a, a countermeasure to defend that target. So you gotta do both during the vulnerability assessment uh, process. And the uh, methodologies out there, there's a whole bunch, all right? Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, but there's a lot of them out there. Carver, that's at the top of the list. That's the one that tends to be the one now that's being used pretty much worldwide. Most foreign governments are using it. In fact, I taught many foreign governments how to use this back in the 1970s. But there's a bunch of them on there, and I won't go through them. Just know that there is other assessment methodologies out there. So a vulnerability assessment process. I like to put this down very simply, five-step process. And people sometimes don't do these in order, and you really need to to get the most out of the process. First, many people never ask this question. What are the assets I'm trying to protect? I like to know that before I even go to the site because what do I have to do? I have to come up with a threat assessment for that particular infrastructure. I have to say, okay, what are the threats to what? The assets. If I don't know the assets before I go out there, then I'm already behind the eight ball. So I wanna know my asset inventory that, I, that that infrastructure has. I'm gonna work up my threat assessment and that's what I'm gonna use for the roadmap to do the vulnerability assessment for those assets. And then countermeasures, that's what I'm going, that's going to be the result of my vulnerability assessment and the scenarios that I create. And then step four, what are the risks, security solutions impose? One of the things people forget is that if I protect one asset, what do I do to another asset? I probably make it more desirable because this one here is protected more. 
So you've really got to weigh whatever you do and how it affects other assets or the rest of the infrastructure. Then step five, cost. You know, in the old days, I never worried about that because if you wanted a vulnerability assessment, you got to expect there's cost. Now, everybody wants to know, well, what's it going to cost and how much improvement is this going to give me uh, security-wise? And I never used to worry about that, but now I have to, and we've come up with spreadsheets, uh, and I'll show you one as we go, that go ahead and quantify uh, improvement. And then the, the, the process, really pretty easy. Most uh, of the uh, vulnerability assessment, assessment methodologies use the same process. You have a planning phase, data collection assessment, and then the reporting phase, and the one that brings tears to your eyes is the reporting phase. Nobody likes to do that. I like to do the on-site stuff. So the stuff Nick was talking about, punch it into a computer, it does a report for you, I love it, I love it. But right here, the data collection phase, that's all your Carver stuff, all right? That's the stuff you're gonna collect data, and you're gonna come up, and you, then you're gonna assess that data, and that's gonna go ahead and rack and stack all your assets uh, or quantify uh, your results. And then threat assessments. Uh, what are threats? Uh, what are the threats we faced? In this particular case, you can do a threat assessment, create design basis threats, which is your roadmap, do a threat spectrum, that's the uh, racking, racking and stacking the threats uh, to that facility, and then, you then you're going to create the adversary scenarios. Okay, let's go into this a little bit deeper, because one of the things in the course we teach, and I've been to many, many vulnerability assessment cor courses, they never talk about threat assessment. The assumption is you do it. But what we do, we spend a whole half a day out of a three-day course just talking about how to do a threat assessment, what's in the threat assessment, and how you use that threat assessment when you do the vulnerability assessment. Very, very important. So uh, what you're going to do is define the uh, spectrum of threats, what is targeted, who will target it, why will it be targeted, and how will it be attacked. Okay. Uh, so how do we get there? Threat assessment largely based on uh, information that we pretty much get off the internet. You know, back in 9-11, right after 9-11, or just prior to 9-11, you could go on to a nuclear power site anywhere in the country, click on it, you would get videos showing how it operated, you'd get a tour guide through the, uh, through the uh, nuclear power plant and everything else. Right after 9-11, you click on that same site, it says contact NRC for more information. So people now are trying to get stuff off the internet that was freely on there, but guess what, it's all there someplace. So the bad guy can do just what you can do. You can do a threat assessment on the internet, so can they, all right? So all the information's there, and that's primarily what we use, and the reason we use the internet, because we want to come up with numbers for recognizability. And how better to recognize an asset as a target by going on the internet and seeing how recognizable it is. So it gives you two things. It gives you all the information you need to conduct your threat assessment, and it also uh, gives you a recognizability number for that particular asset. And then design basis threats, extremely important. And uh, give you an example. Uh, in 1970, there was maybe four design basis threats for FAA. Remember in 1970, they started hijacking planes to Cuba. And how'd they hijack a plane to Cuba? Either an edged weapon or a gun. So they came up with ways to protect against guns getting on airplanes. And then as things went on, uh, you ended up with 9-11 box cutters, plastic box cutters. They had to come up with a design basis threat to prevent that. So, a design basis threat is nothing more than what could happen, not how it can happen, but what could happen, all right? And that's what you're going to use to protect that particular asset against. So you're looking at, usually in paragraph form, one short paragraph describing adversary, type equipment, knowledge, tactics, and MO. And I've got one up here I'm going to put up. Uh, this is one I almost use all the time now. It used to be a car bomb or a truck bomb you wouldn't even think about 20 years ago. But now, guess what? That becomes, after Times Square, the attempted bombing there, Morrill Building, which is right here, and then the Marriott Hotel in uh, Pakistan. Vehicle bombs are becoming 
something that you have to be concerned with. Now, when we do a threat spectrum, and you'll see that in a minute, a vehicle bomb, probably very high impact, but low likelihood that it's going to happen. But you got to have it on there. You got to have it as a consideration. One of the reasons is easiest thing to prevent uh, from happening. With bollards, in fact, Jennifer mentioned that. Bollards and things of that nature. It, it can be prevented or at least reduced. Standoff distance, too bad for this one. They had plenty of standoff distance, but it wasn't quite enough for the size bomb. So this is where your threat assessment is developed as to how much uh, of a, uh, a device would likely be used in that particular context. Okay, uh, the threat spectrum. Important because here again I say you got to quantify everything, especially for your client because he wants to know how you come to that conclusion. How do you rank this? What do we protect against? So we do a threat spectrum, and it could be based on, oops. <coughs> it could be based on weapons, adversary types, mode of attack, uh, on and on and on. And what it looks like is here we've got a, a potential target. It's a generating station. And this is one I actually had to do. And we had to come up with design basis threats for that generating station. What are the threats to it? Because when I say you've got to spend a million dollars to protect against this, you want to say, how'd you get there? So we have to develop a threat spectrum. And basically what that comes down to is we picked the uh, six, VBIED, a large vehicle born IED, active shooter, placed uh, device, arson, physical attack, ballistic attack. And ballistic attack in this particular case is different from an active shooter. Active shooter, who's the target? It's people. Ballistic attack, the target is equipment. And if you look at all of the, uh, the transformers around the U.S. that have been hit by rifle fire, taking that system out, uh, ballistic attack comes out to be very, very likely. So for this particular infrastructure that we were assessing, ballistic attack, most likely, but the least damaging. And then you work on up. And usually when you get up here, you're talking about loss of life, and that's why impact tends to be a little bit higher. So uh, that's your threat spectrum. And we use all of these, by the way, in the course, if anybody has not taken the course, we provide all these uh, spreadsheets so that you plug in numbers, and we teach you how to plug in the numbers. You come out, and it graphs things automatically for you. And what I do is an out brief before I ever leave, the last day of the vulnerability assessment, I'm going to do an outbrief of what I'm going to put in the report because I don't want no surprises when they get the report. So I'll do an outbrief and I'll put these visuals in there and it goes over big. I'll tell you what, visuals are a big part of the report. Okay, adversary attack scenario. And I mentioned this is pretty important because if you can't convince your client uh, that an attack is not only possible, here's how it could be done. And you're doing this because you've got training as a bad guy. In addition to being the good guy, you need to understand how the bad guy works. So in this case, we've got an active shooter, and we put down who that active shooter is. This is the design basis threat. So in this uh, context, we're going to say it's an employee or a contractor who has access to the facility. Most shooters that we've had have had access <clears throat> to wherever they're doing their uh, dastardly deed. So that's the design basis threat, and this is the uh, uh, attack scenario. And this has to be specific because it has to be believable. It has to be plausible. In this case, single active shooter gains access to the headquarters built building using valid credentials, goes on, kills a lot of people, and then when the cops come, he kills himself. Very, very typical of an active shooter uh, exercise. And boy, when I go to uh, facilities and a big sign on the door, no firearms allowed, and I say, you know, really that doesn't stop the active shooter because almost all active shooter incidents have happened where they've had signs up says, guess what, can't have a gun in here. So going on, we talk about the Carver assessment methodology. Now, one thing I found is Carver can be used as a standalone, but it can also be used to assist other methodologies that don't work very well. Now, the U.S. government paid Sandia National Laboratory millions of dollars to create uh, vulnerability assessment methodologies for water systems. 
and they did it all wrong. Because what they did is they had a bunch of scientists create the assessment methodology. Scientists don't know nothing about terrorism, and they don't know nothing about security, so they, but they like formulas. So they created this formula right here. Risk equals probability of attack times your security system effectiveness times consequence. And I said, well, what's the probability of attack? Oh, well, we don't know, so we just put the number one in there. Well, when you put the number one in any formula, what is it? It's a constant. It doesn't change that formula much, or the answer, it doesn't change it much at all. So, when, after the first assessment I did for water, said this didn't work at all, we added Carver in for probability of attack, and now what we got was Carver, this is without Carver, look at all these assets, identical. So EPA says you gotta fix them all. They're all the same probability of attack. But you add Carver in down here, in other words, the chlorine is a higher probability of attack than a pump would be. It changes the dynamic. And now you've got assets that differentiate between each other. You know where to put your resources based on probability of attack. So here we've got Carver actually helping another vulnerability assessment methodology that was supposed to be a standalone. And then Carver is subjective in a sense and that two people doing Carver can come up with slightly different numbers. In other words, this is the criteria for Carver. A uh, five would be a mission stopper. A five, uh, easily accessible, no effective security for accessibility. Well, I might put a five in here, somebody else might put a four. So we might be off a number one way or the other, but in the end, you're not gonna be off far in the totals you might be off of a point or two. So the nice thing about Carver is, we give you the exact criteria you have to use, you can fudge it a little bit, you know, but you'll still come out with a good answer. So all the criteria is in there, and John, who uh, put this uh, spreadsheet together, actually set it up so you scroll over a cell, drop down menu, says exactly what, you, what to put in there, and the number scale. So. Carver, in a sense, we've made it as easy as we could. Now, the Carver matrix, when you're all said and done, our spreadsheet is kind of vanilla. Uh, it doesn't look like this, but the nice thing about spreadsheets, if you can use them a little bit, you can put pictures in, you can spread things uh, apart, you can put colored lines in. In other words, you can pretty it up. And that's what we do in our final report, we pretty it up. So in this particular case, we've got electric power station, we show the highest threats uh, are to a transformer and cooling system, and also the bushings, all right, for ballistic attack. In other words, we put in, we describe what the asset is, we say what the asset is, and we put in the design basis threat that's gonna affect that asset the most or gonna uh, destroy that asset. So this is what we do. And basically, when it's all racked and stacked and all sorted, you know where you have to start on putting in your countermeasures from top to bottom. Well, that's all well and good, and they can do that, but then they start looking at cost. Once we recommend all these countermeasures, what's this gonna cost me? What's it gonna do for me? So when you do a Carver chart, or you do Carver first, you gotta do it again. You gotta put in all your countermeasures right in here, and uh, as examples of countermeasures, ballistic barrier, on-site security, exterior cameras, video analytics on the, uh, avenues of approach. You can even go to ground-based radars. In other words, you're gonna put in countermeasures that are pre prevent a ballistic attack from happening. And if you did all of these, you're gonna get a 59% increase uh, in security for that particular site. And that's what they wanna know. And we provide spreadsheets for that. By putting in this, what's it gonna get me? And this way it helps justify the cost on all of this. So you got before and after Carver, works really, really good. And then Carver for other things. Uh, Luke did a, an assessment uh, for penetration testing, actually went to a company with a whole team, and they wanna know how easy it would be to penetrate this company, bad guy, uh, competitive uh, uh, intelligence or uh, steel secrets, how easy it would it be to get in and put an audio device in certain parts of the building, uh, the corporate building? And they did it and actually did it. 
by putting uh, duct tape in places where they would put an audio device, they had to figure out where they could get to, whether it be public areas, executive conference room, CEO's, CEO office, and they ranked those based on Carver criteria. The nice thing about Carver criteria, you can change the definitions of these any way you want to fit whatever assessment that you're doing. Competitive analysis, they did the same thing. Uh, on how competitive are we against our prime competitor, competitors that are out there. So Carver works good in a lot of different ways. Uh, this one here, Leah West and I, in fact, I don't know if Luke got involved, but we did 11 naval bases, uh, counterintelligence. They want to know how do we go ahead and quantify attacks against our infra uh, infrastructure for critical information. So basically, we just changed the criteria from security assessment to a vulnerability uh, uh, counterintelligence assessment. Instead of critical systems, we're looking at critical information on down the line. So we changed all of the criteria for Carver to meet a counterintelligence vulnerability assessment, even getting down to access or recognizability. Evaluate the likelihood that a potential foreign intelligence service would recognize that the information exists where it's located at, uh, so forth and so on. So Carver can be used a lot of different ways. And the nice thing is when we give a training course, students go back home. I'm usually on the phone with them months after, helping them run through their uh, spreadsheets, helping them run through their assessment. And that's all free of charge. You take the course. We help you out after the fact. And then. Uh, Car uh, Luke and I wrote a book, Carver, you guys have all gotten it so far. It's pretty good. What we've done is we've taken the course and we've tried to uh, summarize that course in book form, at least so the process is there so that somebody can follow. And we've done this for security, we've done this for uh, uh, businesses, and we've done this for other different types of uh, analysis that you could use. So it's all there. Uh, got his historical uh, perspectives of Carver, the matrices, versatility, and then what we've also included in there uh, toward the end is report samples. Because we put in different report templates, and it's not saying you have to use one, but it gives you an idea of different types of reports you could use and use the ones in the book as a template to follow. So all in all, I know that was pretty quick. But uh, if anybody's got any questions, fine. I'm going to be around. We're going to go to happy hour, I guess, after this. And, and much easier sure, to talk sure. with a drink in hand <laughs> than, it, than it is up here. But all in all, there you go, guys. That's our carver. <laughs> uh oh. I think we forgot you, but thank you. I appreciate everything. Thank, thank you. For you sharing your knowledge and a token of our appreciation. Great. And let me thank Luke for having this here in uh, Sarasota. The last one he had was up in Virginia during a snowstorm. I got sick as a dog, couldn't talk at all for the Carver presentation. But Sarasota, I love. Next one's going to be Vegas. That's where I live. <laughs> we got to get Leo. Yeah. We got to get my picture real quick. He wants a good picture. Oh, sure. All right. All right, so I'll just uh, some some closing words here. Uh, first of all, thank you all of you for, for staying throughout the day. I hope you found this uh, very uh, educational and, and useful and somewhat entertaining as well. Um, just a quick note about Carver. We do do the Carver course. We do about six of those a year. So here comes the shameless plug. We usually do them in DC, and we'll do one in, in, uh, in Las Vegas every year, too. But if you want one here in Sarasota, I know that Leo has no objections to coming to Sarasota to give a course. Uh, and it's a lot cheaper than putting your, your officers on an airplane and flying them up to Washington, DC for a week. So if you do want to have a Carver course in Sarasota, we would be more than happy to hold one here. If you guys want to discuss with us later, we usually when we do it, we can, we can combine a lot of different agencies uh, to, to cut the cost. It, it's really a significant significant saving. Uh, and I do want to mention, too, a uh, 
two of our former interns at Security Management International, our USF students. Uh, they came up to DC, took the course. They are now both working for Congressman Paige and Sammy in the back. So congratulations on your, your new jobs. Sammy is also a, a Marine as well, so he's representing the military uh, also. Um, and I do, with that, I also want to thank, we have an award here uh, for uh, Carlos. The, the USF uh, Office of Veterans of Success has been fantastic. We, we really, we didn't even know about this, this venue, and, and Carlos and his team and, and his uh, troops have been fantastic in setting everything up, so just an award here for Carlos. Thank you very much. For all you do, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, next award is uh, for our our MC of the day, uh, David Boss, Super Bowl champion, soon to be Hollywood stand-up comedian, actor, whatever it's going to be. We're going to see Dave on the big screen here. So Dave, come on up. Thank you for a job well done. And then last but, but certainly not least, uh, the, the man who everybody in this room knows, a man who needs absolutely no introduction, the reason that everybody is even here today, uh, and a guy who is so humble he would never take credit for anything, but we have to call him out anyway. Jay Riley, please come up for it as well. Uh, Okay, and with that, uh, we'll, we'll like to conclude our, our second annual CarverCon uh, event. We hope to see all of you again. If you have any questions, like we said, we're going to go down to the Westin and have a, few, have a few cocktails, and Leo will tell some more stories if you buy him a martini. Uh, so he'll tell you where the bodies are buried. So thank you again for everything. Thanks for coming out, and I uh, hope to see all of you again soon.